Welcome to the Power Women Summit Inclusion 360. I'm Sharon Waxman, the CEO and founder of the RAP and RAP Women. We are here and in historic year to come together as women and men, as artists and business leaders, young and old, as people committed to being part of the change that is happening in our world. The summit is a space to celebrate equality and inclusion, the values we want to see in society, and in particular in entertainment and media, because what happens in the heart of entertainment spreads all over the world. And while we couldn't be together in person this year, 2020 was not a time for us to skip the summit. On the contrary, it's a time to make sure we stay the course and move forward. Thousands of you signed up to be here today because you know what happens when we show up together progress, inclusion. So a big welcome to all of you. But let's be honest, not every step we take is forward and not every change is the kind we want to see. And this year has been a year of tragedy and of hope. Tragedy in the pandemic that is still ravaging our country, shutting down our industry and making the future precarious for so many and uncertain for us all. Tragedy in the cruel, careless deaths of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But it is also a year of hope. People of all colors and backgrounds came together to demand an end to systemic racism. More voters came to the polls than we've seen in more than 100 years. And that ended in the election of our first female, Black, and South Asian Vice President, Kamala Harris. Kamala, we were lucky to have you open the summit last year, and now you're headed to the White House. There has been nothing but disruption this year in entertainment and media, with theaters closing, companies merging, layoffs happening. There is suffering because of this. And women and underrepresented groups have suffered more than most. But we've also seen minorities and women continue their historic rise. 
the shows and the movies are telling stories we have not seen before, whether the documentary On the Record or the series Watchmen. And we've seen women rising in the executive suites. So congratulations to Perlina Igbakwe, who became chairwoman of the Universal Studio Group. And to Susan Rovner and Francis Berwick, who are now running NBC's entertainment group. And to Channing Dungey, now running Warner Brothers Television. And Anne Sarnoff, running Warner Brothers Entertainment. We have also seen the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences do the unthinkable, create incentives in the awards races to diversify the movies that tell the stories of the world to the world. According to UCLA's annual Hollywood Diversity Report, women and minorities are now within striking distance, as Professor Darnell Hunt has put it, of proportionate representation when it comes to lead roles and total cast in movies. And in the TV report that came out this fall, female showrunners in 2019 were creating nearly one third of broadcast TV shows. That's not parody, but it's an improvement. But here's the bad part. <laughs> that same category was still 89% white in 2019. We need to do better. Overall, women are still underrepresented in writing and directing. And as streaming dominates entertainment, we need those numbers to more closely reflect our society. But with all that said, I wanna leave you with a sense of hope that fills us all as 2020, and a brutal 2020 it's been, draws toward its close. Ahead of us at this summit are three remarkable days of discussion, debate, performance, inspiration, mentorship, and connection. It represents the best of who we are and the versions of ourselves we aspire to be. So thanks to you for being here. A special thanks to our wonderful staff who put this together. Thank you to our many sponsors who made sure that in a COVID year, the summit would be bigger and better than before. And my special thanks to our incredible advisory board. And now, onward to the Power Women Summit Inclusion 360. And now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Emily Vogel. Emily? Thanks, Sharon. My name is Emily Vogel, Programming and Editorial Manager for events at The Wrap and Wrap Women. You might also recognize my name because I write and curate our bi-weekly Wrap Women newsletters. But don't worry, it's not like a regular newsletter. It's a cool newsletter. From career advice and self-care tips to industry insights and celebrity interviews, we've got you covered. Just sign up at rapwomen.com. Now, before we dive into this morning's programming, just a few housekeeping notes about what you can expect over the next three days. To follow along, you can go to rapwomen.com and just click Power Women Summit. On this site, you can also stream every session. Feel free to catch up on discussions you may have missed or rewatch your favorite moments. We will kick off every morning at 9 a.m., all of these are Pacific time, with a fun morning activity to start your day off right. I hope you enjoyed body positive yoga with Jessamine this morning. She was great, and I know I'm definitely feeling sore. At 10 a.m., we'll jump into our hour and a half main stage programming. My colleague Sharon will guide you through an exciting 90 minutes of performances keynote conversations, and panel discussions. At 12.30 p.m. PT, we'll have our first round of breakout sessions, followed by our second round at 1.30. During these breakout sessions, you'll have the opportunity to choose from a variety of panels, workshops, roundtable discussions, and fireside chats. At 3.30 p.m., we'll host our mentorship sessions. If you upgraded your ticket to include mentorship, you should have already received an email with your designated date, time, and mentor assignment. At 5 p.m., we'll conclude each day with fun performances, screenings, and surprises. Throughout the conference, attendees will be encouraged to connect and chat with each other via our Wrap Connect Slack channel to exchange personal insights and ideas. If you've registered for the conference, you should have already received an invitation for this in your inbox. We also encourage you to share your thoughts and findings on social media. We're using the hashtag PowerWomenSummit2020. And feel free to tag us at The Rap Women on Twitter and at Rap Women on Instagram. And of course, a special thank you to our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. We appreciate all of your support. Now, let's get back to today's programming. Day one of Power Women Summit 2020 is focused on storytellers. From poets and award-winning filmmakers to leading actors and musicians, you'll hear about some of the most influential voices in the industry and how they are using storytelling as a platform to build a more inclusive industry. Enjoy. Back to you, Sharon.
Thanks, Emily. I'm excited now to welcome the talented author, poet, and activist, Asia Mayrock. When Asia was 16, she published her first book, The Survival Guide to Bullying, which was inspired by her personal experiences with bullying at a young age. Now at 24, she's released her second book, Dear Girl, a poetry collection that takes readers on an empowering, lyrical journey, exploring truth and silence, healing and resilience. Thank you so much, Sharon, for having me here today. I am so excited to be here. Today, I will be sharing three poems from my book, Dear Girl, which is my first book of poetry, and it's about a journey from girlhood to womanhood, all told through poetry. First, I will read you the poem that inspired the book, and its title is Dear Girl. Dear Girl, Oftentimes, we women start to rise, and then certain people devise a plan to disenfranchise. Whether it's our bodies or rights, entice us with movements, unite us through persecution, make it seem like it's all right. Dear girl, open your eyes. We have come so far, it's easy to resign. We've got equality, but public policy shows the contrary. Honestly, one in six women could be raped in their lives, and it's mostly seen as a victimless crime. What should every girl know? You are not some puppet in a puppet show. Expose the double standards, the hypocrisy, the hate. It is never too late. This is the moment of girls taking the reins. It is time's up. It is me too. It is everyone from me to you who has spoken or stayed silent but strong. And for every survivor who speaks only to be met with intimidation, investigation, and disbelief, dear girl, you will be believed. If not by Senate floors and investigators, we will hear you, dear girl. We will see you, dear girl. We will stand by you. For the survivor 3,000 miles away or the one next door, you are heard. Justice will not always prevail, but we will continue to fight tooth and nail. You are heard so that our sisters and daughters will never be asked, rather harassed, whether they wanted it, regretted it, or just forgot. Believe me, no one forgot. Dear everyone, this moment is a movement for every girl out there to reclaim her place, win every race, for everyone out there, listen in. The system is in demolition. Grab a hold of your voice. It is time to make a choice to believe survivors, to pay us all the same, to give women of color equal access and opportunity, to protect the safety of trans girls every day. Make the choice to change the climate. Make the choice to not stay silent. This is not just the day of the girl. This is the future of girls. The next piece that I will read to you uh, is also from my book, Dear Girl. You tell your daughter that she is being emotional, irrational, yet you tell your son that he is being strong, smart. You are teaching your daughter to doubt her feelings, to question her beliefs. And so when she is mistreated, she will think back to what was said under your roof, and she will believe that those gut feelings we speak of are merely irrational thoughts while your son believes every thought he has is fair and right. Be careful how you raise your daughters. Be careful how you raise your sons. When you teach your daughter that her body is only pure, untouched, you are teaching her that she can be ruined at the hand of a man. Raise your daughter to know that what's in between her thighs is hers to own whether it be for a woman, man, or anyone to see. Teach your daughter that she is a gift so she knows her worth but doesn't feel shame in sharing her beauty. And the last piece that I'm going to share with you is called The Truth About Being a Girl and is the first piece that I wrote 
uh, for this book many years ago, and, um, and I'm excited to share it with you today. People always say that the girls of this generation are so vain. Why can't they put their brains towards books instead of good looks? I used to blame girls too. Be more than a perfect body with a pretty hairdo. And then I stepped out into the world. I opened my eyes to the truth about being a girl. I heard guys say things like, dude, she was 10 times tighter than that girl you hit and quit, Ray. Or I want to pipe your sister someday. Or her ass looks like a racetrack with those stretch marks, but at least it's big like Kim K's. I never grew up thinking of those things. Don't blame me, but when I thought about boys, I thought about dinner dates and soulmates, not fuck boys that look at you like shark bait. It breaks my heart for every girl growing up in this world instead of how was your day messages? We get you up, want to come fuck? I am not an object. I have a voice and something to say. Do not assume that I belong in your bedroom. I belong in a conference room. And for anyone who thinks that this generation is so vain, it's because us girls are held under a microscope day to day. It's like beautiful doesn't even exist unless you can cross everything off the checklist. Big butt, big boobs, skinny waist includes small nose, plump lips, bony hips, hairless, careless, but still has an awareness. In all fairness, I want to be seen as beautiful too. I mean, I don't want to be demeaned. I mean, I am not the same girl I was at 15. I mean, I am stuck in between being a girl and a woman, growing up in a world that has taught me to look sexy, get a degree, maybe a little rhinoplasty, but never, never disagree with misogyny. A world that has not taught me that being a woman means living in fear that your basic health care will disappear or that your paycheck might somehow be smaller than a man that does the same job or that your boss might tell you to stop giving him blowjob eyes. If you want to raise, you've got to compromise. Show me what lies above those thighs. Boy, please, the moment you misidentified everything, you forgot that not even a hundred years ago, I could not vote. Look at what happens when you try to demote the very bodies that give birth to you, please. We are used to it all and we are appalled, but you see, we don't know what it's like to be free. Equality is not just about calling someone out. Equality is accountability that my brother knows that I am equal to him. So equality is education. From classrooms to courtrooms to conference rooms and computer screens, it is using tech for good, for me too, for movements. Equality is truth, is strong voices, is breaking through the silence that exists because silence can't exist if it's not tolerated. It is all of you changing the future, clearing the path for every woman and every man. It is raising the next generation to know that not only does their voice matter, but it will be heard. And that's why we got the power in our hands because we will not sit back and nod and smile while certain people reconcile the rules to being fertile. Sorry, but it's my body, baby. I may be a young lady, but my dad always taught me to speak out and fight against injustice of every kind. So here I am speaking out for all my ladies in the house. We will not stop the fight until we hold our rights for women of every color, size, shape, sexual identity and place in this world. And that is the truth about being a girl. Thank you. Thank you, Asia. That was wonderful. And now I'm honored to welcome lawyer, professor, and equality champion, Anita Hill. In 1991, Anita Hill made history when she accused her former supervisor, Clarence Thomas, of sexual harassment when he was nominated to the U.S. Supreme Court. As a black woman testifying in front of an all-white, all-male Senate Judiciary Committee, the odds were not in her favor, and Thomas was confirmed. However, Anita Hill's testimony forever changed the way we talk about sexual harassment in the workplace. Today, as the chair of the Hollywood Commission on Eliminating Sexual Harassment and Advancing Equality, Anita Hill establishes best practices and policies for addressing abuse and discrimination in the workplace. Over the past few months, the commission has released a series of reports 
from its landmark survey of nearly 10,000 industry professionals. Now here to talk about her work is Anita Hill. Welcome. Hi, it's wonderful to be introduced by Sharon. Two years ago, I spoke at the RAP conference and it was just after the Brett Kavanaugh hearing. Needless to say, it was a really grim time for many of us, many of us survivors in particular, because what we realized what was that the government had dismissed Christine Blasey Ford's complaint about being sexually assaulted without even offering her a, a proper investigation. However, at this event two years ago, just being in the room with really intentional, resilient, and strong survivors and victims was just what I needed to be able to look forward. It also emboldened me to make promises to you, to the audience then. And what I promised was that the Hollywood Commission would stand up for victims and their right to be heard even if our government didn't. I promised that the commission would dig in and work to improve systemic bias and to get rid of systems that promoted harassment or failed to enforce rules. I also promised that we would work to change workplace cultures from cultures of indifference to cultures of respect that were functional, that honored the contributions and dignity of every person in their organizations, regardless of their status or what position or role they played. And then finally, I promised that I would gather more information, information about what the workplaces in the Hollywood entertainment industry was like. Working with our partners, and we did have a cooperation of many of our partners in developing a survey. The survey went out in November, and by February of this year, we had 9,630 people log in to answer 110 questions to give us the information we needed. Our goal was really to hear from the people perhaps that we'd never heard from before, to hear from a broad range of people, from the wardrobe people to the makeup people, to freelancers, to actors, and actresses, people in offices who worked at desks. We wanted to know more. And our instincts were confirmed that some people had not been heard from. In fact, one statement that we got really sums up why we have been so diligent to hear from a broad array of folks. And that person wrote on a question that, that we gave an opportunity to answer, you know, uh, an open-ended question. This person wrote, just because a few famous offenders are being held accountable when reported, by the most famous victims does not mean anything has changed for the rest of us. We know that in order for change to be real, to be effective, it has to include everyone. So in our survey, we learned a lot. We learned from some very powerful statements about why people are drawn to the entertainment industry. They're drawn because of the desire and enjoyment of being with creative people. They join because uh, they want to influence the world. They want to influence the world through their crafts and through storytelling. Uh, but they also uh, want to hold the industry accountable and responsible for being respectful, for being equitable for accepting responsibility and for, and I quote, doing the right thing, no matter the circumstances. For me, all of these ideas about creativity as well as equity come together to spell inclusion. 
Unfortunately, we also found that only 49% of our participants found that the culture in the workforce or in the workplaces throughout the industry valued diverse backgrounds and experience and perspectives. That's not enough. We know what this means. We heard this summer from so many individuals after the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd about what it's like to feel that you're taken for granted or you're not treated with dignity or that your, about your voice is not valued. We knew that in order for the systems in that are in places in our workforces um, have to be trusted. We believe that diversity and inclusion is a human value as well as business value. And so the question is, how does this industry respond to the real need for more diversity and inclusion? Which ironically enough, we found that our participants wanted, they wanted more information about diversity, they wanted efforts to be more inclusive. So how do we get there? Well, we have to change the culture. And one way actually is to change the culture through both content and operations. We know that diversity and inclusion cannot be seen as an add-on. It has to be integral to every part of the way we conduct business and the way we lead. There was great opportunity, as I said, as I found in this industry to be more diverse, to be more inclusive. And we actually had a uh, a group of workers, actually a, a workforce that wants it. And what we also learned from research was that diversity contributes to better products, better decision making. More diverse and inclusive workforces are more creative, better at problem solving, and better able to respond to the demands of today's consumers. And on an environment that values marginalized people and their perspectives and experiences is a must. I mentioned Black Lives Matter and the movement of this summer and how it brought about a reckoning, a reckoning that was felt inside the entertainment industry. But I also will remind people that industries around the country are looking for better, looking for more, looking to be more included and have values represented that show that people are respected. We can be better in the entertainment industry. But to do that, we have to make changes. Uh, one of the things that we can do is to aim to prevent bad behavior not just wait until it happens and then put in place procedures to address it once it happens, but to end it before it happens. We've got to deal with issues like gender harassment, microaggressions. Uh, we've got to be able to detect implicit bias. We have to problem solve, not look for some kind of superficial compliance and check the box compliance, as we call it. Only then when we began to try to, to, to change our culture and become more inclusive, can we begin to put into place the systems and practices that are going to move us forward and make us able to be, uh, respond to bias and abuses of power. All of the practices in the world are not going to work unless people trust them. So we've got to build a values-based system. And perhaps most importantly of all, we have to ensure accountability. Accountability for values, for violations, excuse me, 
We have to ensure accountability for violations and for retaliation. We've got to put together um, a commitment that begins with leadership at the top. And it was this leadership that brought us together at the Hollywood Commission to uh, launch what we will be launching, at least in the next year, a, an app that will help us to hold serial abusers accountable for their behavior. Um, that app will allow people to put in their complaints anonymously initially. And when a complaint about the same person uh, comes into the system, they will be notified. That way we can offer individuals a chance to come forward with the support and knowing that someone else has experienced the same problem. We also have to review our practices and policies, the practices and policies for hiring in particular. You know, in this industry, I hear very often that word of mouth means everything. And what it often winds up meaning, uh, maybe too often, is that people who are hired are the people who look just like the people who are hiring them. That can change, but it'll only change if we start to self-evaluate and we review our processes. Um, I would, there's two more things I'd like to add to our must-haves. All of these things I believe we can do, but we also have to make sure that as we do all of our practices, all of our policies, uh, that in fact what we are doing is using the individuals who are bringing the complaints as the source of developing those policies and practices. For example, we have to have trauma-informed investigations of complaints if, in fact, if we're going to ever be able to hold people accountable. Most of all, we have to ensure accountability for violations and retaliations. You know, the survey that we did showed that there wasn't any one group of people who believe that an individual who had sexually harassed a, someone who was a subordinate would be held accountable for their behavior. We can do better than this. We at the Hollywood Commission are doing our part. We have established and are, are building and developing and app to identify serial abusers so that we can stop behavior before multiple people have been violated. One of the problems that we have in this community or in the industry, as well as industries throughout the country, is the problem of hiring. We hire people who look like us. And for, that, for this industry and so many others, that means that all of the people or the majority of the people continue to be white males, especially those in leadership positions. We need more trauma-informed processes and policies, especially investigations. There's so much more work to be done, but where accountability is concerned, we must do better. This summer, I had the privilege of being part of a conference that, that was devoted to uh, the agenda setting for survivors. And the survivors were the ones who were making the decisions. I think it's a wonderful model. And I think the time has come for all of us to think about our processes, about our policies, from the point of view of survivors. Clearly, clearly, we're not there yet. 
But with conferences like the, this one, like the one I visited this summer, with all of us working together, we can move forward. And I'm more confident today than ever before that we will. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Every year we set aside time to pay tribute to survivors of sexual abuse. This year, we're honored to recognize the survivors of Russell Simmons, Sherry Schur, Drew Dixon, whose stories are the subject of the HBO film, On the Record. Here to speak with them today is a co-host of The View, Sunny Hostin. But before we bring them out, let's take a look at the film. They drove across the country to New York with a dream to make hip hop records. It's only now that we're really unpacking how toxic so much of that time was. I didn't tell that many people about what happened with Russell. He's the king of hip hop. My community won't hate my guts. I don't have a stitch of violence in me. I would never hurt anyone. If white women are not believe, what do you think is happening to black women in America when we come forward with stories about sexual violence? The New York Times called me and said there were other women, but they won't go on the record unless I go on the record. Everybody was taught things happened, you just didn't talk about it. Every woman's story deserves to be heard. I've been a victim for 22 years. I'm tired of being a victim. I'd like to be a warrior. Well, thank you to the RAP and the Power Women's Summit for providing this platform to allow these brave women, these brave survivors to share their story. We are joined today by Drew Dixon, an accomplished record producer who has collaborated with John Legend, Estelle, Kanye West, Whitney Houston, Santana, and Mary J. Blige, and Sherry Cher, author, rapper, and founder of the first female DJ and rap group, Mercedes Ladies. These amazing women are here to discuss the award-winning documentary from HBO Max on the record and how women of color are often silenced, too often silenced, when speaking out against sexual assault and abuse. Thank you both so much for being here with me today. As I mentioned, uh, you both are so brave uh, and, and are so courageous for speaking up and speaking out. Um, and I would imagine that um, it was difficult to do that in large part because as I mentioned, women of color are often too often silenced when speaking out against sexual assault and abuse. And I also think there are cultural pressures and forces that pressure you to remain silent. So um, I'm gonna start with you, Sherry. Uh, how did you gain the strength to speak out? Um, it really took a lot because it was a long journey for me. Um, as um, starting the first all-female DJ rap group, from the Bronx, um, we was also uh, at one time uh, signed with Russell, uh, the group, our group. And um, so at the time of uh, when I came out or when it happened to me, it really, I never heard nobody he did this to. And I and it, it was hip hop and he was bringing hip hop into a mainstream. So it was a thing where I grew up in the Bronx and you know, you was taught to be silent. I come from a, a single parent um, household, my mom of 11. So, you know, I was a Bronx girl out the street and, you know, what stayed there, you stayed there, you held it in. And we was always taught to be strong. You had to be strong and tough. And especially we being in a rap game. Um, and what gave me the courage is that I um, tried to, how you say, bury what happened inside of me to keep going on with my career. Um, and I ended up writing my book, got it published. and. Um, that journey, I didn't want it to be about what Russell Simmons did to me because it would have took away from the journey of Mercedes ladies. The courage is, um, people didn't know it was indicated in my book when I wrote it. And um, at that time, I didn't feel I had no support in anything. And I thought like, everybody's like, who's gonna believe me How, like, going against Russell Simmons? And so I just kept on with my journey in 2017 when I came out, I mean, when I got this phone call and everybody's like, are you watching the news? And I seen all these women come out and I was like, oh my God, it was, it was a very, very uh, uh, integral moment in my life because all these years I was like, I knew nobody who did this to. So when it came out and um, I was on the LA Times at that time 
And what gave me the courage is that I just felt it was time. And then I had people that supported me as far as family and knew about this and knew that I just kept this inside fear of my career getting blackballed and everything that I just felt in my heart. And my mom had just passed not too long ago. It's something she said to me. And um, it just, I just knew it was time. And then these women came out and I like, they're not lying. I wrote about this years ago, this happened to me and I never, and it just was like, wow, all these women are coming out, amazing women, women from different walks of life. And um, I was just like, I got to come out and tell my story because we, I don't know these women, we had nothing in common, but we had one general thing in common. And so seeing these women come out and um, seeing, you know, finally it's being brought to light, then I knew it was time for me to just um, take that courage and and face the giant. Well, from one Bronx girl to another. (laughs) (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Yes. We are often taught to keep that silence, to to keep that silence. And and it sounds like when you saw other women um, coming forward, that gave you some additional strength and some additional courage because alone we can survive, but together we thrive. That's right. And um, let me then ask you, Drew, what what gave you the strength to speak out? Because you were the first, I believe, that spoke out publicly. Mm -hmm. That was very difficult. The first women who came forward were actually that I was before I walked into the New York Times, which I did in November 2017, off the record. Two women had come forward about both Russell Simmons and Brett Ratner. That's right. So Brett Ratner had been accused, and then two of his accusers included Russell Simmons in their accounts. And in one of them, Russell Simmons was the aggressor. And that rocked me to my core because it was the first time in 22 years it occurred to me that I wasn't the only one. For 22 years, I wondered what weird misfired signal led him to like almost short circuit like that to do this thing to me. And I blamed myself, you know, and and also like Sherry said, I didn't want to do anything to undermine hip hop, which when I was raped in 1995, it wasn't even clear that hip hop was going to make it this far to quote Biggie. There was no Grammy category for rap music when I started in the industry. So Russell represented more than just a person. Russell represented a movement for this art form that I loved that also spoke for my people. So it was jaw dropping to me to understand that Russell had done this to other people. And so I ultimately decided to go into the New York Times off the record to tell them my story, hoping it would encourage them as reporters to keep going and find somebody maybe who would be willing to go on the record. After I left the New York Times, Jenny Lumet's story came out in The Hollywood Reporter, her beautifully written first person article, you know, piece where she told her story. I didn't know Jenny at all, but that was jaw dropping to me because the relationship they had was in some way similar because it was not like some sudden stranger danger situation. I mean, she knew him. He groomed her over time, which I now know he did to Sherry. He did to so many of us. Also, it happened in the apartment. It happened in the same place where it happened to me. So then it started to make me think about going on the record. And then Carrie Kloss and Kaligi spoke out. I think it was on Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving Eve. I was watching the news or some morning show and she spoke out. And then it occurred to me that going forward on the off the record wasn't enough i had to do more i had to stick my neck out and support these other women to get their backs because he was calling them liars and that was one of the other things that pushed me over the edge he released a statement talking about i do yoga i'm a vegan i could never hurt a fly something like that and it made my blood boil because i want to be really clear russell was violent with me he physically attacked me i fought him off i like fought him hard you know, like kicking, screaming, crying, begging, fighting. And so when he said he couldn't be violent, that infuriated me. And that was one of the reasons I decided to go from off the record to on the record. Well, that that is such powerful testimony. And again, it, it requires so much strength. I was a 
federal sex crimes prosecutor. And so I've, I've heard from hundreds of women um, and I know how hard it is to come forward in the way that both of you did. Um, you know, I think there are unique challenges facing black women and raising their voices against abuse and assault, specifically in the entertainment industry. Um, let me um, ask you, Sherry, was that, uh, you mentioned that it was difficult for you to come forward um, because you didn't want it to impact your career, which so many women uh, are reluctant to do that because of their careers and because of their families. Many of them are, are the sole breadwinners. Um, how, you know, how were you able to um, manage that coming forward in the entertainment industry? And do you think there was a backlash? Well, um, absolutely. Um, as, um, you know, uh, being uh, started the first all female DJ rap group in hip hop history, and then when my novel got published, actually it was the first female hip hop novel ever got published, talking about the way of the females that was in the Bronx and how we was paving our way against the all male arena. So coming out with all, I mean, for me doing that, and I started my group when I was 15. So this has been my passion. I used to run away from home, come home and get beat from my mother and go back out in the street because the hip hop, for the love of hip hop outweighed the beatings. So this was like a passion for me. And at the time, hip hop wasn't making money. Hip hop wasn't going nowhere. It was just something we did. I did it to get out the block, to get up to, do you get on a mic and talk about stuff that was going on and it just felt good. And we'd be on a block battling and we were females battling too. So it, that was just a relief from the pressures at home that I was going through. And as far as when, the, when that happened to me, it really, it was shocking to me because for the simple fact, it was like it, my mother, you know, when Russell came to my home and he met my mom and she had 11 kids and he told her, okay, I got them. You know, my mom was finally believing about what Mercedes ladies was, what I was doing, not a game. Not I was going to get pregnant. She finally shed it light to what I was out there doing. So that was an integral part of my life. That was a moment of me and my mom a bonding. And so for him that to end up violating me and, and I couldn't say nothing because I didn't feel I would have support from the community. And in the hip hop community is very tough. Mm -hmm. It's very tough because it was already a, a all male arena and you, you didn't have but like a handful of women. And then here we were all women group. And so to come out against Russell, who came and brought hip hop to the major, uh, the major league, me as a black young woman from the Bronx coming out, like what I used to think, like what power would I have? Who's going to believe me? They're not right, like get out of here. So I didn't really feel I had no support from the hip hop culture. Um, I didn't feel I had support from, from the community. And as a black young woman growing up, you learn to um, nurture and, and, and stand for your hood, especially black men in your, you know, the men of color in there. And how dare you come out and try to um, put him down when he's already being put down by society and police, how dare you? So you had a silence and a code that you had to keep because it was just that you was just that nurturer because that's how we was raised to be from my mom. You just didn't say nothing would happen. You shut up, keep your mouth and keep going. And that's the culture we was raised in. And in hip hop, it, it is a culture of that. In what I'm the beginning of the culture, so I know it was culture, which was a real no snitching, and um, I didn't feel I would have had the support or the resources or the back, and I would fear of the backlash, and also fear that he was gonna try to stop my book from coming out, try to stop me, you know, stop the power, so, the power yeah. balance, the and power. You know, yes, absolutely. I'm hearing both of you say. Uh, similar things in in the sense of um, who is going to believe me if I come forward? Um, you know, where is my support system going to be? And I see through the documentary, you women uh, certainly were each other's support system, which is yeah. so very important. Um, Drew, let me ask you then, um, what message do you have for other victims of sexual abuse? Wow. Well, first of all, I don't agree with so, uh, with so much of what Sherry said, yes, yes, and yes, the fear of being blackballed, ostracized, kicked out, just completely shut down in your career is so chilling and devastating and was certainly a big reason in my decision not to come forward for 22 years. I didn't want to be perceived as a problem. And in answer to your question, what my message would be, you know, 
it kind of relates to that. It's like the flip side of that. Part of why I didn't come forward, there's so many reasons why I didn't come forward, but one of them was that I didn't want this to be what I was known for. I didn't want this to become my sort of, you know, my brand, like Drew, the, the woman, the rape victim, or worse, the woman who tried to take a black man down, you know, the woman who cried rape, the woman who got in over her head and then wanted to complain about it or you know, so I, I kept going and then I went to Arista Records and had more hits there because I wanted my work to speak for itself. I wanted to be clear, you know, this isn't what defines me. What defines me is my talent and my work ethic and my contribution to this industry and the culture. And part of why I didn't come forward and what I would say to other survivors who aren't speaking out for fear that this will define you and that you'll be known for this for the rest of your life and somebody will Google this and think of you as a rape victim for the rest of your life or whether it's in your community or your school or your church or your team or your family or whatever the environment is where you've been abused. What I learned is that for the 22 years that I didn't tell anyone, I thought I was liberating myself from the burden of this association. And once I said it, I realized I was actually free from that for the first time in my life because no longer when somebody asks me about my life or my career, do I stop, think five steps ahead to whatever answer I get to make sure that it's not going to accidentally get to Russell or get to some question that's going to accidentally expose him. I spent so much time trying not to be a rape victim that I actually was victimizing myself by trapping myself in this tiny little playable area of this tiny little corner of the game board or the desktop that was the only space I allowed myself to operate in because I didn't want to accidentally bleed out of my little secret cover-up for his sake, thinking it was for my sake too. And when I finally said it, it's like I woke up and the whole game board was playable again. The whole desktop was usable again. I could just wake up and be myself. I could just wake up and be Drew Dixon. And the fact that I was raped is just a small part of my life. I don't think about it every day anymore. So the irony is what I would say to every survivor is if you think that not telling you is keeping you safe, I promise you, you are only doing the work of your abuser. You've become an accessory after the fact. Every day that you keep his secret, and the surprising truth is that when you come forward and you face it and you get rid of the secret and you get to the other side of it and you find support, you'll be free. You'll find a strength you didn't know you had. And for me, and I believe this may be true for others, there were parts of myself that are my creativity, my strength, my confidence, my swagger, my audacity, my ambition that were in the same box with the pain and the secret that I buried in a basement. And when I unlocked it, when I unlocked the box to get to the pain to like tell the New York Times and go back to my life, all this other stuff that I'd forgotten about came back. My creativity, my power, my confidence, my swag, my ambition. And I'm saying to every survivor listening, there are things in that box that you need. There are things in that box that have power. There are things in that box that will set you free and validate you and it will become a distant memory if you just get it out in the open, get it over with, stop picking up his bloody gloves to reference OJ because I am old like that. Do not clean up his crime scene anymore. Set yourself free and find a strength that you never knew you had. Wow. I, I can't begin to tell you how important uh, the words that both of you have spoken tonight, uh, today, will mean. I can't begin to tell you. Drew and Sherry, thank you for sharing your story of courage and strength. I am so inspired by your bravery, and we appreciate you with, uh, being with us today for this extremely important and timely discussion. We are grateful to the RAP and the Power Women Summit for hosting this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Sunny. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And RAP having us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. What incredible women. We so appreciate their willingness to share their stories with us. And this evening, we'll be hosting a Q&A for their film, On the Record, with the directors Amy Ziering and Kirby Dick. Two years ago, 
at the first Power Women Summit, we honored the survivors of Harvey Weinstein. During that event, one of the survivors, Louisette Geis, had the opportunity to meet 11-time Oscar-nominated songwriter Diane Warren, who was at the summit performing with Marissa Corvo. The two got to talking and came up with a brilliant idea to write a musical about the Me Too movement. Here to talk about the project and show a clip from the production is Louisette Geis herself. Thank you so much, Sharon. I cannot tell you how elated I am to be here. As you know, um, being here at this summit is actually where I met Diane Warren many years ago. And uh, because of you for bringing all of us together, I'm so excited that this musical has now become a reality through much hard work, but I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So what you're going to see here is the song, We Want More. Uh, there's a line in there that we want to put an end to this. This is about coming together as women and speaking up, breaking the silence. We have our lead uh, singer. Her name is Marie in the show, played by Robin Herter. She's incredible. I would say that Marie, the Marie character is mostly aligned with myself. Uh, as the writer, I, I really drew from real life experience from when I came forward for the first time. It was incredibly nerve wracking, um, but I really lifted some of those words that I used that day and I put them into the lyrics, which you'll hear. It's also based on um, being on the courthouse steps in February with many of my other survivors, you know, friends, um, and that how you really get barraged by the reporters. They're not always as kind as you. And, uh, you know, really what that dynamic is. You're going to see Lisa. There's a character of Lisa uh, who's really pushing them to give more information and how challenging that is. Lastly, our lead, Eleanor, played by Alicia Humphreys, is deciding she's a she's a CEO, top of her of her game. She has worked so hard to get here. And now she has has to decide if she speaks up, she knows she will lose everything and she decides not to at this juncture. And we see that dichotomy and the, the challenges that she goes through. And lastly, we also have a real survivor, uh, Sarah Ann Massey, whom you know uh, well, has been at many of your events and she actually is one of our contributors. So we brought in, again, tw over 20 uh, survivors from uh, Weinstein to Toback to R. Kelly to Russell Simmons, Hoffman, et cetera. And these women came and shared their stories and we lifted actual things that they said. So one of the monologues in this, uh, this clip is from Sherry Cher, uh, who I'm sure everyone's going to know and love by the end of this summit as much as I do. And it really just speaks to how challenging it is to be a survivor and, and really bear your soul and the pain that you go through to do so, but also how it really lifts us all up to do the right thing. So enjoy the Right Girl musical. We want more. A group of survivors, Marie and Lisa, are seated at a press conference facing a large number of reporters. Eleanor is watching it all unfold on TV as she is standing outside the soundstage looking at her cell phone. And it was an anonymous source, very senior in the company, who provided a lot of physical evidence confirming these stories. But it is the brave, courageous women who went on the record who will inspire more women to come forward. Let me just say, after all I've been through since Paul attacked me, this is the first time I've been able to tell my story publicly. And that's true for all these women. It's also the first time we've been able to pursue justice in court. So I'd like to start- So aren't these old stories? Didn't everyone know this was going on? Oh, How much so money are you looking for? Didn't everyone know so this all these old old stories? stories? Coming forward like this has a cost. It's not closure. It's like bleeding out. You're reliving your trauma, being questioned, being told you're doing it for money, attention, fame. Let me tell you right now, I did not want my first time in The Hollywood Reporter to be about this. And it also brings up guilt for not stopping him. And how, how could I have let this one event ruin me? 
he stole my ability to earn money. He, he told everyone, oh, she's trouble. Stay away from her. Stay away from me. I've opened up a flood of memories. Held back for what feels like centuries. Scared I'm gonna tell my story wrong. But together we will make each other strong. How are we gonna break our silence now? Speaking up and standing side by side is how. It's like hope would be an opened up and bleeding now. But we want more. We want to put an end to this. All the denying and lying and crying. So we can just exist. We want more. None of us wanted this. We have to be brave with the fears and stands on the edge so it all goes away. We want more. Play back everything you stole from us. Inner peace, self esteem, and trust. Our voices will tell our history. We're gonna start a brand new reality. So now we're sharing how you heard us. And sharing our day will shatter us. We will put the pieces back together But we want more We want to put an end to this We want to see all the time and time and time So we can just exist We want more Hey, hey, what's with you over there with the big smile? You're pretty pleased with yourself? Uh, let me tell you something, anchor boy. My mom taught us not to cry. We just had to be tough, just had to go with the flow. Always broke, getting evicted, life falling apart. But don't you dare cry, Mama said. It's not allowed. So now here, I'll be honest. I, I was paralyzed for 20 years over what that man did. And I had to look at him on TV. His whole life is one big award show. But now there's this group of white women speaking out together, saying he did this. Do you know that with white women, there is this stereotype that they are docile and sweet and innocent and pure. But if this docile, sweet, innocent, pure girl can still be questioned, and and not believed and discounted. What do you think happens to a black woman in America when we come forward with these stories of sexual violence? But he did the same thing to me 20 years ago. And it's like a sense of courage comes to me. Like my mom's spirit is like, don't you dare cry. I remember she'd be beating my butt when I was little. And she said, don't you dare cry. And you know what? It gave me a sense of control and empowerment. No crying. So now I'm telling my story and I'm in pain. And you ask me why I'm smiling? <laughs> because he finally got caught. And victory's coming through. So yes, I am smiling. Because I was never going to let him see me on TV. Yes. No.
Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll quit today and I can start at Supreme immediately if you and the rest of the board still have me. Great. I'll see you then. Yes, mom's the word till I see the press release. No, no, no. No, Sam, I wasn't the anonymous source. Please don't spread that rumor. Yeah, if you, if you say so, Sam, yes. No, I'm very clever with the press. I'll see you tomorrow, Sam. <sighs> some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. We want more. We want to put an end to this. All the denying and lying and crying. So we can just exist. And now we'll hear from a group of multi-talented women who found success both in front of and behind the camera. They rose to fame as actors, but they've since moved into the director's chair. Working with Lifetime, they've been able to bring their passion for storytelling to life. So please welcome Directors Robin Givens, Kim Raver, Elizabeth Rome, Kira Sedgwick, Ashley Williams, speaking with Lifetime's head of movies, Tanya Lopez. I really wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have Lifetime and Tanya Lopez. And I love that Lifetime champions women, especially women of color. There's so many ladies that people are telling to tell stories. Because we've got so many stories to tell. The future is female. The only way that storytelling develops and innovates is from new voices. They encouraged me to bring my voice to this material. Lifetime supports a lot of female filmmakers. That makes me really proud to be working with this network. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Lopez, EVP of Scripted Content for Lifetime and LMN, and I am entirely thrilled beyond to have all of you on this panel today. I feel like I've had journeys with each of you, and I can't believe this sort of opportunity to bring, you know, this, this universe into one panel, but it's great. And, I, and I'm really excited to moderate this because I know what incredible actors you all are. Um, and that taking this step to get behind the camera was, was a journey for each of you and, and on your own individual course. But uh, what I also, what we're doing with this panel is really putting a spotlight on Lifetime's broader focus initiative that really supports the hiring of women in key production positions. So not just as directors, but in all across um, behind the camera. and. While this industry, I know, has been trying to reach the parity, this year, Lifetime has been hiring women for 35 years. And I, I, you know, I'm proud to say we exceed industry standards, but it seems like that's what we should be doing. So it's funny that I feel this idea of, of course, this is what we should be doing and not that we should spotlight ourselves, but this is the way the world should work. In fact, Lifetime has served a pipeline where we have been the first place for many female directors to get their start, you as actors, but there are women right now uh, going into production that have never directed a movie before. And I heard from a couple other um, friends in this club, Angela Bassett sends her love and said, you know, it was an awesome journey. And even Ligoria, who's starting to direct her first feature, talked about her experience as a first time director on Lifetime. And I think the thing that we really want and have proven to do is that we support you guys all the way through. Um, I, wanna, I wanna introduce each of you and your film. So I'm gonna go in an order 
uh, of uh, not quite. I thought I had an order of how at the timing of each of your directing, but I'll probably be off a little bit. I'd like to introduce Kira Sedgwick. She EP'd and directed a movie, a uh, story of a girl. Kim Raver, who EP'd and directed Tempting Fate. Robin Givens, the director of Anne Rule's Murder to Remember. Ashley Williams, director of Anne Rule's Circle of Deception. And lastly, Elizabeth Rome, with her upcoming movie, she just finished, director of Girl in a Basement. So I applaud you all for getting to the finish line because sometimes that the, that's the biggest journey to start, begin, and end. Uh, so Kira, I want to start with you, but I'd like this to be answered by all of you, which is you, you talked, you thought about, I want to direct. And where was, when was the moment that you actually said it out loud and made it real and sort of put that tent pole in so that you knew you had sort of gone public with this um, aspirational moment? Okay, so I was the person who never had that voice. I, my voice was, you will never direct. Um, I had been working professionally as an actor from the time I was 16, and, um, and I'd worked with a lot of legendary directors, all of whom were men, um, and I just thought, they have a whole idea of how they're going to shoot something before they even get there. And they have a whole visual language that I don't think I have. I definitely have the language of the heart, you know, but, and I figured I would be good with actors, but, um, but I never, but that, that was a hard no for me. That was a never. And it wasn't until I was in my late forties that my, um, my loving husband kept saying to me, you, you have such big opinions about, the way things are directed, um, you know, why did they do that? Why did they do that? That was such a, you know, why didn't they shoot? Why didn't they cover her this way? And, you know, a million thoughts. You know, what about, you know, the concept of you directing someday? And I was very much like, I don't think so, not for me. So it wasn't actually until as a producer, because I had been producing since I was in my 20s, um, I was sitting outside of, um, of Tanya's office at Lifetime and I watched this video of like broad initiative, broad perspective, broad, whatever it is, broad focus. Broad, focus. broad focus, whatever it was. And I was like, oh my God, look at all those actresses working. And um, when we were talking, she had asked me if I had a passion project and the and story of a girl was a novel that I had bought in 2007. And that it, this was 2017 when we were talking and I had never been able to, to uh, get it made. I had a director, I had a female director, female writer um, who adapted the, the novel, but I never got to get it made. And then she, I said, tell me about this broad focus thing. Cause I was there as a producer to say like, what are you looking for? What kind of shows? And she said, you know, so we're, you know, women directing and do you have a passion project? And I said, yes, it's story of a girl and I want to direct it. And I literally was like, <laughs> what the <laughs> what happened you know and really like that was it and that and there was and it came out and then Tanya's like eyes lit up I mean it was so lovely and she was like I want to read it I want to read it right away and like I sent it to her like the next day and like practically the next day she was like I love this and let's do it so it was kind of magical that's wow. I, um, were you nervous when you left the office after you'd said I wanted to direct? Yeah. I think I was like, oh, my God. But then I figured you'd never do it because it was, so, <laughs> it was very edgy. You know, I mean, it was very edgy and very, like, it didn't feel like a Lifetime movie to me. You know, we'd always pictured it. And you guys let us do everything we wanted. We went to film festivals with it. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. So, you guys, I will always, you know, be so grateful. And now I do it all the time and I love directing. It's like, it's the thing I wish, I feel like this whole crazy acting thing that I've been doing since I was 16 was like just the preparation to do what I'm really supposed to be doing, which is acting. Okay, now I'm going to stop talking because there's a lot of other people to talk. Kim, I'm going to turn to you because uh, yours was a, was, was a long journey as well, at least in the lifetime process. Yeah, I mean, Kira, and first of all, everyone, I'm so happy to be with such great company. And Tanya, thank you for having me. But Kira, it's really interesting because you, in a way, led the way, right? And I think that that, for me, is the thing of, you know, you have examples and you see other women doing things. And it sort of unconsciously 
starts this like little um, seed of something that I wasn't even really aware of. I mean, for me, I think, you know, first of all, having, you know, a single working mom as an example was something of like a dynamo thing of like women just do everything. (laughs) Right. But I don't think that it came to me first of like, oh, I'm going to direct. I think what came to me first was I really want to put together projects. And so my husband and I had found uh, these Jane Green novels and uh, I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is about women. It's for women. This is lifetime. So I went and I I pitched the first one uh, to Tanya and um, she's like, I love it. And it was going and everything was going and we had it written. And then all of a sudden, somehow we like, there was some sort of glitch and I, Tanya was like, oh, I don't know. And I said, let me just come in there one more time. So I came back in and I said, I know how we're going to sell this. We're going to sell this movie, not just one movie, but seven movies. She's like, I like it. What are the other movies? And I was like, the other movies are. And I was like, Brrr. she's like, I'll give you five. I got to catch a plane, work it out with my executives. I got to go. I was like, okay. And then I went home to my husband. I was like, we've got five. Oh, here we go. And so then as we were going, we narrowed down actually the best. And Tanya was like, you know what? Let's do a trilogy. I was like, yes, let's do a trilogy. And then um, we got, you know, I just love sort of the whole development of it from the beginning, from the novels, creating how we were going to sort of like kind of piece out the three, how they were going to complement one another. And then I, I, there was like a Michelle Obama speech where she was talking about women and like, kind of like, is it Albert Finney and network? Like, we're not going to take it anymore. And I was like, we're not going to take it anymore. And I, I have such incredible examples in, in Shonda Rhimes family of so many women, like, you know, Debbie Allen doing, she's acting, she's executive producing, she's directing. And so I just was like, why not? I was like, yes, I'm in. I want to, I want to learn direct too. And Tanya was like, great, you're in. And I don't think it hit me until, because I was so also in the development of it. There was one really big meeting, Tanya, do you remember that? Where it's like we would move 10 steps forward, but then like five steps back. And there was a lot of forward and back. And there was like this resolve to like get it done. And there we had literally, I think we had like 20 executives from everywhere on the call. It wasn't a Zoom call. It wasn't this. It was just a phone call. And Tanya was like, we are in the foxhole. Are we going to do that? Oh, I know what it had. It was like, we are going to shoot these movies. First, it was 16 days. And so for beginning director, I was like, okay, great. 16 days, I can do that. I do episodic television, eight days, 16. I was like, that's great. And then it was like all of a sudden down to like 14 or 15. And Tanya was on the call and she's like, we are in the foxhole together. Are we going to make this or not? And no one spoke up. And I was like, it's on me. I was like, yes, we are, Tanya. I've got it. We're going to do it. And she's like, good. And then everyone was like, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And then I hung up and I was like, Oh my God, we're going to do it. Like, and there was like that anxiety of like, I've moved this train forward and now it's on me. But there was this exhilaration of, I think, you know, it's like, same Kira. I've been like doing this so long that to be able to then take all of that kind of knowledge and have this um, excitement about learning sort of like the new parts that are in my body that I haven't gotten to explore and to kind of do that uh, to me, I think that that sort of, for me, that was like the moment of like the actual directing idea percolating and then just jumping on and going. And I, remember to- that. I remember that call. I remember yeah. who's turning on each other. We're in the foxhole. Who is turning on each other? Um, but it's really because of you, Tanya, I have to say, because I think that is the, the thing with women getting hired and women getting hired in positions maybe that they haven't done. It's, it's about someone in power uh, taking that leap of faith that we can do it. 
and 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 giving and sort of passing that baton and and that and I think that that is sort of the key most important because without opportunity you you can want all you all you want but without someone green lighting you to do it um it's it but I will say and this is a good time to sort of pivot it to you Robin because I think you still you may want it but you still have to be that squeaky wheel you still <laughs> like and not, I'm not the calling you a squeaky wheel but I know <laughs> your passion so let me hear your journey yeah you know I, I'm sort of like here I think you know I've been doing this I think since I was like 10 you know it was sort of a hobby by the time I got to Sarah Lawrence I you know and you're sort of studying acting and I had I kind of did this you know, because I was really bad at the violin, you know, but you had to do something creative in my household. And I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, all of this. I found myself um, sort of in this in this field. But I remember during head of the class, and I hadn't thought about this until your question, Tanya, and there was a female director, Lee Shallot, who did this, direct this multi-camera show. And I used to just watch her and go in the control room, she'd call the show, and I was fascinated to watch this woman. And then somebody, I remember doing a mini series, Donna Deitch, who directed Women of Brewster Place. And you, you start seeing these women and you realize, oh my gosh, I don't really see women so often. Um, but I think that sense of, like Kira's husband said, hey, you, you're so opinionated, <laughs> you know, why don't you give your opinion? I remember starting to direct theater, you know? So I had great examples of women that I admired and loved and be had become friends with in Lee and Donna. And then you realize, wow, I do have an opinion and I had been doing this for so long. Um, so I don't remember exactly when I said it, you know, out loud to myself, but I remember sitting at, sitting at Lifetime taking my meeting, you know, when I was kind of like pitching myself. And I remember before I got there thinking, you can do this, right? You can do it, right? You can do it. Um, and then just kind of like diving in the deep end of the pool. Um, and then just sort of loving every minute of it. Being scared to death. Um, we had the pandemic to deal with, you know, as we were finishing up a film. Yes. But you realize, oh my gosh, you know, people, you are leading this ship. And in many respects for me, it really sort of gave me a different voice um, um, as a woman. Um, I can tell you, I remember being on the set one of my, my first days and everybody kind of thinks I'm like 5'10 and I'm like this big, they think I'm this big. And I remember somebody coming up to me going, oh, you're so cute, and like patting me on the head, you know, like this guy that was big and tall. But you realize your voice, that inner voice, um, it, it just kind of gave me a brand new voice that I, I didn't even know I had and this courage. Um, and, and, and that was fabulous for me. So, so thank you Tony, for taking your chance on me. Yeah. We had to shorten the day because COVID had hit and people were fleeing and yeah. we didn't know what was happening. Yeah, exactly. Happening and she stayed calm, cool and collect. Like you want her on that lifeboat. Right. You know, yeah. so I would say that about you, Robin. And, and I'm usually not, which is so amazing. Like, I'm so usually not. So it's interesting stepping into that role and then and leading it. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, how to keep everybody cool. Ashley, your timing was very different because the COVID, COVID had already hit. And you had gotten one day done. So, but let's talk about your journey um, about making this decision. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm a little nervous. This group is so amazing. And I I can't wait to watch this back and fully take in all these stories because they're really all I, this is all I want to do all day is watch women killing it. Um, so yeah, for, for me, I was, um, I was on a soap opera when I was 15. I was a kid actor and I was on a soap opera when I was 15. And um, and it was the summertime and, you know, they got those big, broadcast cameras that kind of float you can like tap it with one finger like for a, for a multi-cam kind of camera and uh there was this operator who was behind the camera and we were just rehearsing and i wasn't you know i i was waiting to go on and i just went up to him and i said hey can i can i get back there for a second and just i just wanted to like operate i just wanted to see what that felt like in my hands and look through the lens and he said to me why don't you stick to wearing your bikini 
Uh. <laughs> I'm so mad. I didn't say anything because I'm very like non drama, like I'm non drama, and I'm you know. But I was so mad, and I think I stayed mad. I think I'm still mad that he said that to me, and it lit this like, oh, oh, I'm gonna. I'm going to take you down, you know? So I started <laughs> at that age, sort of um, committed myself to, to learning the te technical aspects of, of the job um, and was very interested in camera and lenses and diopters and all this stuff um, became kind of like a little hobby that then when I would get to a new set, I could show up when I did they'd think I was like a little firecracker, which I kind of got off on. Um, so I, I loved all of that. And then, but I was still an actress, you know, because the truth is, you know, I was, so I was like, you know, I mean, not to expose our ages, but this was a long time ago. And, you know, in the nineties, all directors were men. I mean, it was just, that was what I was working with. And it, it honestly didn't even occur to me that, that it was possible, you know? Um, and then a couple of years ago, I have a, a good friend who's a very high powered executive in a network and she and I were having a glass of wine and she was like, so like, what do you, why are you directing? And I was like, well, that's, it's kind of, honestly, like, it kind of feels like it's something boys do. Literally, that's what I said. And she said, we, we do not have enough female directors. And it, it, it sort of, that was sort of a, where things shifted for me, you know? Um, and I said, well, I've got all this sort of otherwise useless information that I've, because I've always been studying. I've always not wanted to be in my trailer. I've always wanted to be on set, you know? Um, I have a scene off and I stay in my chair and I'm like, can I watch? Um, so then suddenly I was like, oh, then maybe I should try to do this. And then there was that scary moment of the saying it out loud. And I appreciate you, you know, that, that moment. And, and for me, it's maybe a little bit anti-feminist, but for me, you know, I have two children and I, I needed to go to my husband and just be like, are we cool if like I go pursue this? Cause it's going to be expensive and it's going to, take up the time and we have children and he's a producer and you know, and he literally, <laughs> you guys, camera reminds me of, you know, and Kira, what, what happened with you guys were just the support. He literally got out a yellow pad and he wrote, um, he wrote curriculum at the top of the yellow pad and just started making a list of all the things I was going to do to really work through this. And one of them was to reach out to every single contact that I have in the industry and go bug them. And one of them was you, Tanya. So <laughs> that, was, <hi. laughs> that was how that happened. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, let's, let's hear it for boys supporting, you know, the ambitious woman. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And okay. And Elizabeth, who is literally just came off the set and delivered her cut, which you all know that feeling, right? When you <laughs> deliver your cut, she delivered it this week. So it's not been seen. You know that feeling, which is you had a vision uh, and you're hoping now you're saying, okay, did you, did, I hope we had the same vision. Uh, <laughs> but Tanya, I'm, re I'm really hoping we had the same vision. <laughs> <laughs> but but really just talk about yours because you you just came off and and we were talking earlier about the um about the energy that you need as a director to keep going to keep everyone moving forward but talk about your aha moment well you know it's funny you said when did you say it out loud that you want to be a director and ironically the person i said it out loud to first is kim kim because I was starring in a movie for her. And um, much like everybody here has expressed all of the same stories of decades of working and strong male directors and thinking, you know, why not me? But, but it seems like that role is taken and this is my lane and I'm gonna stay in my lane. And I like Robin went to Sarah Lawrence and I've, I've written a couple of books and storytelling has always been at the core of how I approach acting. Um, but as the last, I don't know, maybe three years unfolded, I seem to be directed a lot by actors. And the tenderness with which they held me was extremely different. And Kim, very acutely different than, than all of them, because not because you're a woman, Kim, 
but but maybe because you're a woman, the way you would talk to me about wardrobe and character and you know my character and just there was such a level of intimacy that I just thought to myself, what the world needs now is more of that. And if not us, then who? Because we've been waiting to do this for long enough. I mean, each of us, how many decades we've been working and we are storytellers. It's not for everybody. I don't know that every actress needs to go try and transition, but I said it to Kim. You know, I said, God, you know, I've wanted to direct forever, but I've been directed by directors like David O. Russell. And, you know, and I think to myself, okay, you know, I don't know, stay in your lane. But I said it to her and she said, you got to call Tanya Lopez. And I was, I felt like you felt, I was like, oh God, what have I created? You know, I got pregnant really fast. I immediately emailed Tanya. I said, can we take a meeting? We went and took a meeting and Tanya and I started talking about passion projects. And one of them was about a, a Sarah Lawrence. And we just really went deep into this rabbit hole of trying to find stories and what to tell. And, um, and then Tanya offered me Girl in the Basement, which was, I probably would have accepted any movie you offered me, but you offered me a movie that I knew a lot about the inspired by the true events. And I really had to tell that story. So even though I was terrified to step into this place and I'd seen some actor friends, uh, you know, really transition, Kira especially also has been an inspiration for me watching you direct and doing both so beautifully. But um, I did it because I had to tell that story. I had to tell the story. I don't know if I'm allowed to say what it was inspired by, but um, the true events that Girl in the Basement is based on, besides just wanting to do it and finally being pregnant with the, you know, the saying it out loud, it was like you offered me, it was almost like just meant to be, you offered me something I had to do. And, and, and it was not easy. You didn't offer me a Christmas kissing movie. <laughs> no, you offered me. That's what you're uh, going to do next because, you know, we may, uh, but I guess, you know, and, and I, I think all of your stories are separate, but there's a single theme in there. And I think it's the captain. You each took hold of being a captain of your ship and you were leaders and you led this and you led this team, this crew and the talent and everything, which, I think that is what um, is what needs to happen. Can I ask you, Kira, as we're as we're wrapping up, how do you how do we keep this going? I mean, how do we keep young women that are passionate about it, any age woman who says, "I'm ready to change. I need a new chapter." I mean, mm -hmm. how do we keep it going? Well, I mean, I think talking about it any chance you can is always a great thing. Um, and I also think for the, uh, you know, seeing yourself reflected in the director that you're working with is the best, is the best, you know, way to pass this forward, you know, is to have, you know, hire female directors when you can, if you're a producer on a TV show, um, you know, hire crew that are, you know, all of our, the heads of all of our, our, um, our departments were women, um, and, you know, except for one and, you know, make sure that, that you are helping somebody else mentoring, you know, you know, reaching down your hand and pulling somebody else up and always talking to young female, you know, actors, like, of course you're going to direct, like, that's not even a question, like, when are you going to do it? But, but I think that the more we keep doing it, you know, then we are role models for all those young actresses who are like you know, need to see women doing that. I, um, and you keep staying in your job and doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, there you go. Exactly. No, but uh, once they hear, I keep saying yes so easy. I got to make sure I fit. <laughs> but I, uh, I, you know, I'm going to wrap this up, but I, I have to salute each of you because like, once again, I got to sit back and watch what you did, Robin, what you did, Ashley, what you did, Kim, Elizabeth and Kira. And I saw what it took and i saw how you were not going to let anybody down that was what was key and i think that you know you were so you put so much pressure on yourselves but that um you know i think that was the passion that kept you all going and i hope you continue to lift people up i will and i will send women your way because I think all these new directors that are directing down in Atlanta now, I, it dawned on me, they should be speaking to each one of you because you know they're scared. Yeah. 
And that's what I know. That's what I'm pulling away from this is I need to use you guys more to say to these women, don't be scared. Don't be scared. And also you had somebody shadowing me. Yes, I did. And, and, you know, she was fabulous and she's a really incredible casting director and she's going to get to direct now. And we're going to keep giving more women to you, Tanya, because Kim gave me to you and we're going to keep, if we recognize in, in other women, you know, this passion that they have and, like you said, Kira, to really recognize it and, and encourage it. Um, we're going to give them your email, Tanya. <laughs> and Tanya, this is what I would say. Even if you are scared, do it anyway, because you'll yes. get through it. <laughs> you know, I'm yes. scared to death. So even if you are scared, do it anyway, and, and you'll get to the other side. I think that's probably the most profound advice. All right, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love seeing you. I Take love care, seeing you. all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. I wanted to stay at home. She sounds really good. I wanted the baby to decide when she wanted to come. My daughter came into this world. For the time that she did. And I can't bring her back. There are miles between us. Martha, is that you? How are you? Sixty to seventy percent of these cases, we rarely find a satisfactory explanation. There is something between us. Certain things medically, we just don't have answers for. To dream. Very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Well, I can't wake without you always. How is Martha? Martha Sparks. You know it's Martha. Time is gone. Have you decided to go to the trial? It's the right thing to do, honey. Because you say it is. She has to pay for her incompetence. We need some justice here. No, you need. Well, I'm trying to disappear my kid. Because we don't have a kid. You have to face this. I am facing this. I am facing it. I am facing this. Who cares about what they think? This is about me. This is about my life. This is me. Between us. Thank you, Lifetime, for that amazing panel. Actors, directors, producers, those were amazing women, and it was great to hear their career journey. I'm now excited to welcome Ivy Kagan Behrman, an entertainment partner at Loeb & Loeb. Ivy represents film and television production companies, cable networks, and advertising agencies in their discussions with the guilds over the production challenges happening during COVID. She's also an advisor to Time's Up and Hollywood Commission, and regularly provides sexual harassment and discrimination training tailored to entertainment industry companies. She handles investigations of sexual harassment claims, and she works closely with television network attorneys 
to resolve such claims. So we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Welcome, Ivy. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. So we thought it would be really interesting to have somebody with some expertise on how to navigate this period of COVID. Um, obviously, the context we're talking about here is this push to, for more equality and more diversity and entertainment companies trying to transform themselves. And then they get hit also with this enormous uh, challenge of the pandemic, which has shut down most production. Um, and then I also want to talk about um, how this is impacting women, because I know that you have some thoughts about that too. But let's just start with how are companies dealing with production right now? So it has been, as you said, extremely challenging. Um, it started out, as you know, many months ago in about March or February, right. um, although we didn't really know publicly that this was going on in February, but we certainly were aware of it in March. And what I found was that initially companies were trying to figure out what to do because the industry had never been through anything like this. It's very different with a strike when people are shut down. They know there's an end in sight. They're going to be able to negotiate something. They're going to be able to navigate it. But with a pandemic, there was no sense of, and I think there still is a, as a concern that there's no sense of when is this going to end and what are we going to do? So the first few months, um, many of us in the industry were working probably 16 to 18 hours a yeah, day, right. just trying to figure it out. What I found really rewarding in that process was that studios and networks and production company lawyers and executives were sharing information and talking to each other and trying to navigate this. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of collaboration among the industry. People were shutting down. They didn't know whether to call it a suspension, a hiatus, a force majeure. So there was a lot of talk about that. And for me, it, it, I got to this place one night. I remember I was getting in bed and I got to this place one night and I said, you know, we're figuring out how to potentially, frankly, limit liability, limit exposure, avoid obligations. Light bulb went off as I'm crawling into bed, which was to the extent that any of my clients can afford to actually help people through this pandemic, let's focus not only on what we legally have to do, let's focus on what we should do. And mm. so the thought process really shifted. Mm. And I think up to the credit of the studios and the networks and the production companies and a lot of people in this industry, people started to look at it that way. It got less legal. It got less about, if you call it this, you only have to do this. If you call it that, you have to do that. And it became, what can we do? Mm. What can we do for the people that work with us? And so it, as, a, as that, with that as your framing, did that help move things forward more? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because um, I know for me and the clients I work with, we became very proactive. We mm -hmm. became proactive at reaching out to the guilds and unions and reaching out to the agents and the managers and other reps to have the conversations and work things out. But honestly, it took a couple of months to get to that place. And I think the uncertainty for everyone was very, very disconcerting. Well, which, which is, we're still there every time, you know, every time you see a production move forward, you read the next day that some other production has shut down. So talk a bit about how this is impacting women and other uh, let's say underrepresented groups that are already facing more challenges than say the established power structure, if you like, uh, during a time like this? Well, what I'm seeing um, certainly is that even though we have in some respects evolved as a society and there are certainly men who are playing a key role in taking care of children, raising children, um, sharing the load, I know that a lot of women right now are dealing with how to be, I was just having this conversation with someone today, as a matter of fact, how to be a teacher, a nurse, a psychologist, you know, all the many hats that they're wearing, and they're trying to work remotely at the same time. So I think that's become incredibly challenging, particularly for women. Although again, I know that there are men are dealing with the same issues. And I think a lot of people are wishing they could get back into the studio, get back into their offices and not have all of this to, to deal with at the same time. Mm -hmm. As we also know, the numbers are um, really, really substantially higher for people of color and particularly African-Americans in terms of COVID and COVID deaths. Right. And so there's a concern in the community about 
their exposure. And at the same time, you don't want to get discriminated against. Mm. And um, I'm also seeing that with older workers. Yes. The concern of people over, I'm, I'm 62 uh, this coming month, and I'm seeing more and more concern or hearing more and more concern of people who are over 60 mm -hmm. and whether they're going to be discriminated against when they are, um, you know, back in the workforce out of concerns that they're more susceptible to getting sick. We've heard that too. Um, we've heard that too. Let's talk a bit about your work with Time's Up, your work on sexual harassment, certainly since 2017, since the, the first kind of the dam broke around Harvey Weinstein. Um, there's just been a, scores, I would say, of lawsuits and all kinds of changes that companies have been trying to implement. Where are we with that with 2020? I mean, everybody's working from home, lots and lots of layoffs. Does that work stop because <laughs> it's an existential moment, really, where some companies are just trying to get through? Right. Um, I, I, the only reason I laughed, because it's not funny, I mean, it's a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. The only reason I laughed when you asked me that question is um, to the exact opposite of it, of it um, stopping, I was just on the phone today with a major studio talking about how we maybe, maybe my team could supplement the hundreds of investigations they're doing right now. Hundreds? Hundreds of investigations. You don't um, want to tell us which I can't, company, I can't, of course. I can't say which tech company I was talking to, but um, so here's what's happening right now that I think is, uh, is interesting. They, we're dealing with a time frame of such social and political unrest. And as a result of that, and you combine that with the Time's Up movement, people are becoming more outspoken. People are becoming more vocal. Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily think there are more claims. I think there are more people coming forward to raise the claims. I also You're saying there's not more instances of sexual harassment. You're saying there's more people who are ready to be vocal about it. Right. Okay. And I think with the situation with Harvey Weinstein and the and the brave women that came forward and were very outspoken about it and some testified, um, that also has led other women to come forward. And I'm always very careful to say it's not just a women's issue because I've investigated claims involving men as sure. well as women sure. who are the individuals bringing the claims. So I think more people are coming forward. I think also because you do have this very socially charged, politically charged environment right now, um, people are, are more vocal about things that make them uncomfortable, even if they're not necessarily unlawful. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I really focus on with clients is not just thinking about what is illegal, but think about what kind of culture do you want to have? And so we're seeing a lot more um, and hearing a lot more complaints about microaggressions and micro, micro inequities and things that maybe don't make for a lawsuit, but are things that you want to try to resolve in your this work environment. This comes to you as a lawyer, though, why? Just in your advising a company on their policies? So it would come, it would come to me in a couple different ways. Um, one would be, and this is the conversation I was actually having with this, with the studio today, um, where people are coming to human resources and they don't like the way someone is speaking to them. And it may not be unlawful, but it makes them uncomfortable, it makes them feel disrespected. So that may be something that comes to me because a client is seeking advice on it. If something rises to the level of an investigation and they want help, I'll come in and do investigation. The other way it comes to me is, as you mentioned a minute ago, was proactively trying to have better cultures mm. and not just training on, again, what is illegal, but training on how to have a respectful work environment where everybody thrives. How do you think Hollywood will look when we come out of the pandemic um, we're just starting to hear about companies preparing to uh, lay the groundwork for when people come back to work. Because in most companies, um, like our company as well, even in the rep, we have very few people who've come back. And most agencies, studios, they're just remote. How does that look to you in terms of changed culture 
on the other side of this pandemic, whenever that is. I think integrating back in to work is going to be very challenging. I liken it to when you haven't seen your partner in a while and you know, you've been on a business trip and you're coming back in to your living situation and you have to adjust to each other again. I think there's going to be a lot of adjusting. People have gotten used to working in a very different environment. They're not used to having these, all of these people around them. Um, I also think that people are going to come into this environment again, very affected by what's going on around us in the world. So, you know, it's one thing to be at home Mm. when you're trying to cope with everything that's going on in our world. It's another thing to come into a work environment where you are going to be interacting with people that don't necessarily share your views. So we're a little bit cloistered right now. You know, we're in our homes Mm -hmm. and we're working um, and those conversations aren't necessarily happening that might start to happen when you get back into the work environment with your colleague that you really like working with who has a completely different philosophy on wearing a mask. Yeah. You know, thinks it's political or um, on what's going on with the administration. And so I think there's going to be a lot of challenges when we get when we get back into the work environment. Well, Ivy Kagan Berman, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us at the Power Women Summit. It was really interesting and insightful to talk to you. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks to all our speakers this morning and to our audience. We have an exciting rest of day planned. Up next are coming breakout sessions that start at 12.30. Our mentorship sessions will start at 2.30. If you signed up for a mentorship, you will have received an email and a calendar invite for the time and date of your session. And all are invited to reconvene with us this evening at 5 p.m. for some amazing music, conversations, and a special screening series Q&A. Thank you.